So uh, I'm Andrew Waterman. Uh, I'm the chief engineer at Sci-5. And uh, back when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, I was one of the uh, uh, progenitors of the RISC-V project. But uh, I'm actually here today in my uh, capacity as the chair of the Privileged Architecture Working Group at the RISC-V Foundation to uh, quickly present our proposal for uh, a hypervisor extension to the ISA. Um, so this, uh, this work came out of a proposal that was initially made by uh, Paolo Bonzini, who's one of the leaders of the KVM project. Uh, John Hauser uh, fleshed it out into a form that we have uh, since incorporated into the uh, privileged architecture spec. So they deserve the majority of the kudos for the work here. All right. So the, uh, the purpose of the hypervisor extension is to virtualize the supervisor mode in the RISC-V privileged architecture uh, so that you can run operating systems hosted on top of a hypervisor. Um, one of the explicit goals of the hypervisor extension is to, is to support a variety of hypervisors not just the uh, type one bare metal hypervisors like VMware ESX kind of things, but also the more hybrid ones like KVM, where you have OSs that look more like processes running on Linux. Um, there are a couple goals for the project beyond, beyond that functionality. One of them is to support recursive virtualization, maybe not at uh, very high performance, but at least without gratuitous uh, extra traps into the hypervisor to do so. And, uh, Finally, we want the, uh, the design in the case where, you're only, where you only have one level of virtualization. We want that to be very high performance, competitive with the offerings from ISAs like x86 and ARMv8. But we want it to be uh, parsimonious in terms of the hardware implementation. Shouldn't be gratuitously complex. And we want simple implementations of the hypervisor extension to be relatively cheap. Now, of course, like anything, the microarchitecture can be arbitrarily complex. Uh, you know, we, I think. Uh, you, you can imagine blowing you know, millions and millions of gates on the, uh, even the virtual memory uh, hardware to implement uh, the hypervisor ext extension efficiently. We're focused on making the cheapest implementations cheap. So just as a uh, refresher, uh, in the uh, baseline RISC-V privileged architecture, uh, there are three privilege modes currently. There's machine mode, supervisor, and user mode. Machine mode is the bare metal mode. It's where monitor code runs, or in simple embedded systems, it's where all the code runs. There's user mode, which is where application code generally runs. So if you have a, an embedded system with some, uh, with some memory protection, some I.O. protection, then you probably have machine and user, by, uh, you probably have machine and user modes. Um, if you want to run Unix-like operating systems, like Linux, Windows, and so forth, you also add the supervisor mode, uh, which provides page-based virtual memory uh, and the, uh, the I.O. and interrupt functionality necessary to host an OS like that. So, the goal of the hypervisor extension is to virtualize that supervisor mode. So the hypervisor extension adds some new privilege modes. So uh, first of all, it adds some additional functionality to the supervisor mode uh, so, that it, so that it can act as a hypervisor. To uh, reduce confusion, we rename the supervisor mode to hypervisor extended supervisor mode, or HS for short. Uh, to be clear, it is still just like supervisor mode. If you took an unmodified Linux binary, you could run it in hypervisor extended supervisor mode just fine. It would just not use this new functionality that's been added. Then we add two more privilege modes. Uh, we add virtualized supervisor mode, which is where guest OS is run. And underneath that is the virtualized user mode where applications running on top of a virtualized guest operating system run. So, the distinction between uh, virtualized user mode and, and regular user mode is pretty weak. You know, the application code can't tell which, it, well, it would be a virtualization hole if the application code could tell which one it's in. Uh, just to uh, minimize confusion, we, we, we call these out as distinct modes. So what needs to be virtualized? Uh, what do you need to do to make sure that the guest OS and the applications running on it can't tell that they are being virtualized and to do so in a way that's reasonably performant? Well. The first one, the kind of obvious one, is you need to virtualize the, uh, the, the processor state that the supervisor mode sees. These are things like the, uh, the CSRs uh, that, that the supervisor mode uses to manage exceptions and virtual memory, and the handful of instructions that supervisor mode has to manage the page tables and, uh, and, and exceptions. Then um, the whopper, of course, is the memory system. And uh, finally, you need to be able to virtualize the, uh, uh, the I.O. and, and uh, interrupt mechanisms. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the latter because it's actually mostly a platform level issue, uh, uh, except to mention that the privilege uh, uh, that the hypervisor extension provides enough functionality that you can emulate uh, devices and interrupts just fine. So, what do you need to do to virtualize the privileged architecture state? 
So uh, first of all, you need, we, we provide additional copies of the majority of the supervisor CSRs. Most of these are things that are used for managing exceptions, like uh, the scratch register, the, the exception program counter, things like that. Um, so we, uh, we call these uh, background supervisor CSRs for a reason I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so they're, they're named things like BS Scratch and BS EPC. Uh, the, the name collision with the uh, epithet is unintentional. Um, and uh, so when you're in hypervisor extended supervisor mode, which is to say when you're running inside of the hypervisor, uh, the foreground CSRs, the things that are the thing, the, the CSRs that you're already familiar with, those named S Scratch, S E P C, those contain at that time those contain the hypervisor's copy of those registers. So a hypervisor interacts with the machine in the same way that in that, that a normal OS interacts with the machine in that respect. Uh, while you're executing in the hypervisor, these background supervisor CSRs. Uh, they at that time contain the corresponding state for the guest operating system if one is currently uh, loaded in. So when you're in the hypervisor, the foreground registers contain the hypervisor state, the background registers contain the guest state. Now, when you are running virtualized, which is to say you're in VS mode or in VU mode, the guest OS is currently running, then at that time the foreground CSRs contain the guest OS's state and the background CSRs contain the hypervisor's state. Most of the background CSRs in this case uh, aren't really active, they're just there for state storage, but a few of them are, like the ones that control the, the two-level virtual memory system. So whenever you transition between being virtualized and not, which, which is to say whenever you go from being in VS mode or VU mode to being in any of the other privilege modes, or vice versa, then these registers get exchanged with each other. Uh, so uh, this can be implemented either by literally copying the bits around or by using a register renaming trick. Um, so uh, some of y'all might be wondering why the hypervisor extension looks a lot different than some of the other privilege modes in this regard. So you know, when we add supervisor mode, for example, we just add a new set of CSRs. We don't add this uh, funky exchange mechanism. And the reason why we did that, uh, there, there's a more detailed discussion in the mailing list about this, but the reason why we did that is because this, this approach provides better support for uh, hybrid hypervisors like KVM. The, uh, if we were to simply just add a new H mode and add H mode registers, that would be fine for bare metal hypervisors, but would penalize the uh, you know, KVM -like, like hypervisors, adding tens of extra instructions per, uh, per, per privilege mode transition. So, as for virtualizing the memory system, uh, we uh, took a fairly conventional approach here. We're using two level uh, address translation uh, using paging. Uh, so, when you're executing in a guest, either an application code or in the OS, uh, the original virtual addresses, which are things like load and store effective addresses, they're first translated to guest physical addresses by traversing the guest OS's page table. Then each of those guest physical addresses is translated by a second level of translation, the hypervisor's page tables, into machine physical addresses. So this is pretty conventional. It's the same way that uh, it works in XA664 or RMB8. Um, one thing that is different than XA664 notably is that the hypervisor page tables are the same format as the supervisor level page tables, which is a great, at least notional simplification. It also keeps the, the hypervisor software a bit simpler. And similarly, the page table layouts are the same. Uh, if you're on RV32, you get the same SV32 style translation of the hypervisor. In RV64, you get to choose between the slew of options uh, of different page table depths. Uh, so touching a bit on I.O. and interrupts, uh, as far as the standard interrupts in the supervisor ISA go, the software and timer interrupts are kind of trivial to virtualize because they're already exposed to supervisor mode through SBI calls, so they're kind of already virtualized. Um, uh, in effect, uh, there's, a, there's still only a single machine timer and, uh, and only a, a single machine software interrupt bit, and the hypervisors and the machine mode are responsible for multiplexing these between guests. Uh, so it's, it becomes a software problem. Uh, the, uh, as for uh, I.O., um, for simple devices that just use, that, that are mostly programmed I.O., they're just using MMIO, then the two-level paging mechanism is sufficient to emulate them. You, know, you just pretend they're mapped into some part of the guest OS's address space and then trap them into the hypervisor, and the hypervisor can emulate that device. Uh, so this works, for example, for the platform-level interrupt controller in RISC-V. Uh, Obviously, that's a, uh, that, per that poses a performance penalty because all those extra traps will add up in runtime. Uh, the PLIC, for example, could be made virtualization aware by adding another context to it. So you, you'd have more state that you would save and restore on every context switch, but then as long as you're mostly staying within one guest, you would avoid all these extra up calls into the uh, hypervisor. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk any more about that because it's outside the scope of the hypervisor ISA. It's really a platform detail. Along the same lines, uh, any devices that rely heavily on high bandwidth I, uh, memory and I.O. via DMA are going to need some additional hardware support via an I.O. MMU. Um, otherwise, you're kind of stuck with low bandwidth pro uh, programmed I.O. But that's also a platform issue. I think it would be great if the uh, uh, RISC-V platforms have a standard way of doing these two things, but it's kind of outside the scope of what the uh, hypervisor extension defines. Uh, so one other goal was to make recursive virtualization work well. I'll just briefly say that it works OK. Uh, you run the host hypervisor in HS mode. You run the guest hypervisor in VS mode as though it were an OS. It thinks it's running in HS mode, but it's not. So you get, a, you get some traps into the hypervisor. The, uh, the host hypervisor has to maintain shadow page tables, uh, but this can all be done uh, at, at some performance cost in the case that you are recursively virtualized. Now, along those lines, and I think this is one of the cool parts of the way that we designed this thing, the hypervisor extension is designed to be efficiently emulatable, even if you don't have it. So if you just have a, a, a system implements uh, machine, supervisor, and user modes, you can implement the entire hypervisor ISA simply by trapping into M mode and uh, emulating a small number of instructions, a small number of CSRs, and maintaining shadow page tables. We added some hooks to machine mode so that the shadow page table maintenance is easier than it would be in a classically virtualized system, basically because we allow you to trap any instance of like, things like SRET, SFINS, so forth, uh, so that, uh, so that you know, the, 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 uh, the machine mode software has the hooks it needs to uh, handle the uh, shadow paging without, uh, without trapping all memory accesses to the page table as you would do in a conventional approach. So, uh, as to where we are on this, uh, the first version of the specification is written. Uh, it's in the ISA manual repo on GitHub. Uh, go check it out. Um, there, is, there are no software implementations of the hypervisor extension yet. We're, we're anticipating to implement it in Spike in, you know, in a couple months. I'm sure QME will follow very shortly thereafter. And hopefully, the first KV import will follow very quickly after that. As I mentioned, because the hypervisor mode can be em emulated efficiently, even if you don't uh, uh, have the hardware, we're hoping that KVM can be brought up on silicon using this in-mode emulation approach uh, with, before silicon comes out. But uh, to be clear, uh, we've had good success in, des in designing these RISC-V extensions by not actually like, finalizing them until, uh, implement until silicon's available. So I'm pretty sure that we're going to wait until at least uh, one research group or company implements the proposed hypervisor extension before we're going to push forward with ratification towards the end of next year. And uh, that's it.